Hey Tina, we've been teaching about Sabbath this past Sunday, so I'm curious to hear from you. What does that mean to you and how do you plan on living that out in your life? Well, I've decided after listening to you over the weeks uh, about cheating on God and worshiping Him and spending time doing and being with Him on the Sabbath, just taking a whole day for Him, I decided like most women do, they, get, they prepare the night before for a date with someone. So I plan on dating God on a Sunday from sun up to sundown, doing starting with church, you know, coming to worship Him and with church family, and just starting our relationship, renewing it, kind of like a marriage when they, you know, to have a date night. So I want to have a date date with, with God. Yeah. I saw that was cute. That's a bring the lights off. A date day with God. Um. We need to try that, right? Imagine that. Getting dressed and having a date, day with God, where God gets all his and he belongs to him. Um, go with me to the book of Genesis. I'm going to land in chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to abstract up extremely fast uh, this morning. And so um, stay awake, stay alert, because you're going to say, did he preach? <laughs> you know, um, and uh, next, because I'm almost at the end of this worship series, but next week, I want to go someplace uh, real interesting in the book of Psalms to kind of talk through that. But I can't leave worship without getting in your business for a little while um, because it's part of worship. Are you with me? And so I'm learning as a pastor when you're going to get in people's business, get in and get out. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, if I stay here for like 45 minutes, y'all going to walk out on me. So um, I just want to show you something in Scripture, and we're going to let God move and let God have his way to what he's saying. So I'm just going to speak uh, from my heart this morning so we can hear what God is saying. If you're in Genesis uh, chapter 2, uh, say amen. Yes. Now let me get there. Um, look with me at verse 1. And um, I'm going to narrate. We've been in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 11 for quite some time. Uh, and then last week we kind of departed with the whole issue of Sabbath and talking about Sabbath. So I just want to pick up there. And move to some, a little passage in, in um, the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis that I want to talk about. Look with me at um, verse 1 of Genesis chapter 2. Say amen again. Let me know that you're there. Okay. Now, before I read, let me give you literary context. Here's what's happening. This is after God had created everything. So uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we see God in the beginning. He created the heaven and the earth and all that good stuff. He populated the earth, he created the animals, he created um, the, the divided water from the firmament. He did all that good, fancy stuff. Now, whether your theology calls for that being a literal seven days or years and years and years that equates to seven days, whatever your theological framework is, I'm cool with it um, because I serve a God that can use science as well. Are you with me? Yeah, I, I mean, God's big enough to do that. You kind of get what I'm saying? So you resolve that yourself. But the point I want to get at today is that, look at verse 1 of chapter 2. It says, thus the heavens, and I'm from the ESV, and the um, earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he did what? He rested on what day? The seventh day from all the work that he had done. And verse 3 says, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in all creation. And then so chapter 2 continues on. And let me just kind of narrate and walk you through this. With God now explaining his introduction of man into the earth realm. It's not that he's just creating man. He has rested from all his creation, and he's now providing us a little bit of detail on what his creation was all about and how he did what he did. He's kind of going through that. But the key that I don't want you to miss is the whole fact that God now is resting on the seventh day and making it holy. So you go through the remainder of chapter 2. It talks about him creating man. Um, look, look at verse 15. It says he gave man a job. I like that. Whenever I go to Genesis, I can't help but overlook that. Hint, 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 hint. Hint, hint, man with a job. Um, uh, yeah. Ladies, y'all should have been saying, thank you. Right. 
I mean, y'all, I, that was the time right there, you know. I mean, come on, y'all working because he ain't working, you know. It's a whole other subject. That's another story, another story. But verse 15, he says he took the man, put him in the garden, and he gave him a job. And God pays well, if you understand, so on and so forth. And then after he got a job, uh, verse 24 um, on, he says, then the woman came on the scene. It's in there. It's, it really is in there. Y'all, y'all, y'all didn't think that was in there, right? After he got the job, then he came on the scene, and verse 24, then the man with a job and a woman got married. Right. Yeah. And then 25 said, and they had good sex. That's 25. But that's after the job, the woman and the marriage, not before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right? I mean, it's in there. It really is in there. I, and I didn't come to preach about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking up my own time, so let me kind of move on. And then um, he, here is something interesting that I'm going to come back to one day. One day I'm going to do this, okay? Um, look with me at verse 23. Katani and I have been wrestling with this. Then the man said, when God brought the woman, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called what? Because she was what? And, and here's something interesting that I found out. Before chapter 3 happened, her name was woman. Yeah, that's real interesting. Don't do nothing with it. I'll tell you about it. Hang around for that series. Chapter 3, the Satan comes on the scene. He messes up people and all that good stuff. Um, and he's causing the woman to sin and all that good stuff, right? Then look at verse 8 of chapter 3. God shows up. Now, I'm not saying this is saying this. This is just Felix speaking. Do your own homework and land where you want to land. And look at what it says in verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the what? I find that, and it says, and the man and his wife um, hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees of the garden. And verse 9, but the Lord called them. Back up to verse 8 again. I have to say this as we talk about Sabbath. Verse 8 says, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves. Now, this is just me. I'm not saying the text is saying this. Because this is the second instance I found a mention of the Lord of the word day after God said he rested on the Sabbath and he blessed that day. Okay? So what this leads me to believe, this is just me. I'm not telling you all to do this or to believe this or any of that kind of stuff. I kind of think um, just on the surface, um, and I haven't done any deep exegetical work yet, that when time came to worship God on the Sabbath, that day that he blessed and made holy... Because they had sinned the night before or the week of, they hid from God. Oh, y'all missed it. Let me go English. The reason a lot of us don't come to church on Sabbath to worship God is because what we did the week before. And we feel guilty, so we go hiding among the trees as opposed to coming and worship God anyway. I'm going to show you something in a little while. That's just me. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm just, it's just me as I'm reading the text. So God does his stuff, right? Um, he cusses Satan out. He cusses the man out. Cusses the woman out. And then man deals with the woman. Look at verse 20. I'm jumping ahead real quick. Okay. You guys look at this. Look at verse 20. You there? Chapter 320. It says, the man called his wife's name what? Isn't that interesting? She had a name already. But then after she sinned, he gives her another name. Notice the context in which I said that. God cusses the devil out. God cusses man out. He cusses the woman out. Then the man said, come here. And he gives her a name. She already had one. Y'all do what you're going to do with that. I'll talk about that one day. I'll give you something to think about. Very, 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 very interesting. Okay? And so now, verse 22, this is what I want to talk about. The Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good from evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take up the tree of life and eat forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him where? Out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had taken. So God didn't take his job away even though he punished him. Thank you. Okay. 
And he drove out the man from the east of the garden of Eden, and he placed a sheriff on a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Okay? So now here's what I want you all to see before I even read um, chapter 4. And I'm just going to be very, very brief to kind of talk about this. God puts man out of the garden, uh, man and woman, or now Adam and Eve, out of the garden because they sin. They've disobeyed God, and, and most of us will think now there is no more fellowship with God because of sin, right? Um, because here's what we say. This is how we say it. I want to just give you an interesting perspective really, really quick. Here is how we say it. God punished Adam and Eve, and he put them out of the garden, so communion was broken, and we naturally assume that God doesn't come down and commune with them anymore, Come on, say amen. Go ahead and say, I thought so too, preacher. You did, you did, you did, because I did, okay? <laughs> now, now, walk with me through the text, okay? Now, look at verse 1, okay? Now, Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel, and it says, Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep. And Cain was a worker of the ground. Now, here's where we're going to go to work. Verse 3 says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Verse 4 says, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock of their fat portion, and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Verse 5 but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard, so Cain was angry and his face fell. You've heard that passage from time and time again. Now, let me help you understand what's really happening in the text, and I want us to kind of see what's going on here. Now, what strikes me about the text as in the context of giving being an act of worship, or now when we come to worship on Sunday morning, all of what we do is a part of worship, I want to help you understand and see if you can journey with me to understand that at the instant in time, Sabbath was still in effect with God. Lock into this with me. We just saw that this passage that we're reading in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis is close enough, not that it happened in subsequent days, but it is close enough to, to Genesis chapter 2 where God created the heavens and the earth and God rested on the seventh day that the principle of rest and Sabbath and worship was in act without sin. This leads me to believe that even though God put Adam and Eve out of the garden on that day, God still showed up to commune with them. Oh, come on, come on, come on. I want y'all to walk with me, okay? Just, just kind of track with the text. Let me give you some lit context to help you understand. So here's what's happening. Because it was the cultural norm in Adam and Eve's life to set aside a day of worship, even though they worshiped every day, I am seeing, based on what they transferred to their children, you don't come to God without bringing something for God. I think I'm seeing that in the text because it's not by happenstance or accidental that Cain and Abel knows about a day and they know about a time to worship God and making sacrifices to God. It was something that was instilled within them. And what I like about the text is that the first thing that I'm learning about God is God still wants to be worshipped in spite of how we've conducted ourselves. Now, let me, let me help you all with that because we serve a God that wants to be worshipped. Here's what I like about the text. Even though in chapter 3, we see God putting them out of the garden, symbolic of his presence, fact is, they might not have been able to go where God was, but God could go where they were. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. Because the good news in that, people, is that you can run. Well, let me put myself in it. We can run. We can hide. We can do whatsoever we need to do, if I can use grandma's term. But because of who God is and God's desire for us to exalt him and for us to praise him, and here's how we saw it in Genesis chapter 20, for him to be first in our life and for us to have no other God before him, the moment we make the declaration that, God, you are number one, He's going to show up wherever we are to receive his praise because God likes to be worshipped. So if I can paint a picture of what's happening here. These two fellows had worked all week long. 
and they, you know, God had the rivers. So the text says in Genesis, he caused the rain, and, and it wasn't some other God causing the rain. He caused the earth to be fertile. It wasn't some other God causing the earth to be fertile. He caused the germination process to take place not only in the seed and in the ground, but in the animal kingdom as well. So here's what Adam and Eve probably said to their children. Hey, y'all, whatever you do, let's never forget to thank God first for what God has done for us. So when you come to worship, Bring him more than a song. Because <laughs> a song in itself is not what he desires, right? Kind of get what I'm saying? So don't just show up to God empty-handed and, and act like he hadn't done nothing for you. Thank him and, and let, it be, let it transcend a song. Let it transcend elevated hand. Let it transcend, come on, uh, the things that we've done more than the vocal cord. But demonstrate to him in the truest sense of the word that he is first in your life by the provisions that he's provided for you. So lock into this. They come to church and the text says that they both brought an offering to God. So they knew the importance of worship. Now watch how this goes out. It says here in verse 3, In the course of time, brought, uh, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock of the fat portions. Look at the next phrase. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no what? And Cain wanted to know what's up. Let me help you understand this. Let me paint a picture here. They come to church, but before they come to church, it's harvest time, Friday. And they reap and harvest, and they pick their stuff. And both boys probably have their own home. I don't know. I'm just kind of speculating. You kind of get what I'm saying? They might have been mama boys. I don't know. But they, the one, one took care of the sheep, and the other one tilled the soil. And if, based on what I'm seeing in the text, this is what this looks like when I read it often. So Cain goes... And he picks his harvest, and he goes home, and he sits at his dinner table with his budget. And he looks at the pile of grain, and he looks at the budget, and he says, they ain't got to pay the mortgage. And he takes that, and he puts it over there for the mortgage. Got to make the car payment. Takes that, puts that over there for car payment. Got to pay cable. And so he takes that, puts that over there for cable, and the pile is dwindling and dwindling. And then he says, well, got to have gas in the camel to go to work. And, <laughs> and I have to have lunch money. And so he takes that, gas for the camel and lunch money, puts it aside, and he looks and he's got a little bit left. And then he says, well, God, it's between me and you. And the text says he puts some aside and he says, this is for me, and that's for God. Notice where God is positioned. Abel, on the other hand, looks at his flocks. And he says, I do know he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And I do know that the earth is his and the fullness thereof. And, Lord, I just thank you for enabling these sheep to produce. And I thank you for just blessing me with this job. And I thank you for how you've just been hooking a brother up. And so he says, let me see which one of y'all I'm going to give to God first. And so he goes through and it says he took the, the plumpest, the fattest, the juiciest one. And he sets it aside and says, this one belongs to God. Nobody mess with that one. That's God's. Okay, now let's handle the bill. So now he looks at the budget. <laughs> and he says, okay. Mortgage, got you, bam. Car payment, okay, got you. Cable bill, got you. Cell phone, got you. Gas money for the camel, Lunch. Oops, got a problem. Well, Lord, here's how this is going to go. Since I put you first, I'm going to trust you to provide for me because I don't have enough. Are y'all not hearing me this morning? I don't have enough to give you because worship is so important that I'm not going to have the audacity to show up in your presence when in my personal life I place you. I wish I had somebody last. I'm going to put you first. 
such that when I show up in your presence, you're going to honor your position in my life. Because somewhere, God, way, 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 hundreds of years down the road, this fellow by the name of Matthew is going to write something in 6 and 33 that says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So it ain't there yet, but in case it comes, we're going to be cool. So both boys show up for worship, and Cain comes, and he drops his. And if I were to tell you how it looked, I don't know. I'm speculating again. He lays his there. Abel lays his there. And fire comes down from heaven. Whoosh! And consumes Abel's. And here's Cain. He's doing the survivor thing with the flint. (laughs) Trying to make it happen. And nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. So he gets what we do in church. Ticked off. Because that person's blessed and I'm not. That person's bill is paid and mine isn't. That person is always provided for and I'm not. That person is living in the nice homes and driving nice cars and dressing well and I'm not. And I'm stuck in a iniquitous cycle of poverty. And so, look at the text, 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face what? Look at verse 6, the solution. I'm almost done. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? Verse 7. I like the NIV here. It says, if you do what is right... Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is what? Crouching at your door. It it desires to have you, but you must master NIV's word or rule over it, ESV. So, Cain, this is real simple. I can help you out with this. Don't come to worship saying, I'm first. When at home, when nobody's not looking, I'm last. Because worship is not just a the day thing on Sunday. It's an everyday thing that you continue to do such that when you come to the day, what you do on the day is a reflection of what you've been doing all week. Long. I wish I had somebody in here. You kind of get this. I want you to hear me say it. Because if you've been doing it this way all week long, don't come on the day and pray for me to fix it. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, it's not something for me to fix. It's something for you to fix and let me prove myself faithful in your life. So, Cain, let me tell you how to do this. Take that same budget you have with me on the bottom and just turn it upside down. Put me up top, and trust me, and then I will deal with the sin that's crouching at your door. A couple of things I'm learning about God. We can't deceive God in our worship. We can't, we can't, we can't, we can't. And I want to use that term worship because here's how the text says it. I think it's in Matthew chapter 6 around verses uh, 9 to 11 or something like that. It talks about, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth does corrupt and where thieves does break through and steal. Because where your treasure is, there your what? Heart is also. So check this out, Cain. If I'm on the bottom of, bottom of your budget, don't try to put your heart on the top. And don't try to fool folk into thinking your heart's on the top when I'm on the bottom. Because your heart is where your treasure is. So if your house is on top, then the house has your heart. That's why I got to say this really quick because you're all about to get mad. Okay. 
but, but I want you to see what's happening in the text. You kind of get what I'm saying? And we wonder why when we come into the presence of God, fire doesn't come down from heaven. We wonder why. Come on, I want you all to hear me. We can't encounter God like that, and we don't experience the miraculous. God is looking for authentic, pure, true worship that's reflective of what we do at home, that's reflective of where he's positioned in our life, that's reflective of how we trust him, and he's calling us to reverse the process by putting him first. So here's what he says to Cain. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And check this out. But if you don't, sin is crouching at your door. And y'all know how this story ends, right? This joker got so mad that he took his brother outside and killed him because of how God was blessing the brother because the brother was obedient to God. Church, hear me, and I'm done. Worship the man's major obedience. Not in some things, but in all things. Is it risky? Yes. Is it crazy? Yes. But man, I serve a miracle-working God. I serve a God, like I said earlier, that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I serve a God that, that, that can heal when the doctors say no. I serve a God that if we learn to put him where he rightfully belongs, he adjusts our lives. But he calls us to trust him. Now, I need to say this so somebody don't get upset with me. Now, now here's the thing. Now, Cain, you messed up your life. So here's what doing what's right look like. Okay, Cain, you've got this crazy house payment, this crazy car payment, these crazy stuff that you have built. And you have me on the bottom. It's cool. You might not be able to give me a full 10%, but if all you can give me is a dime, at least reverse the budget and put God and put 10 cents next to his name. At least you had me first. Oh, y'all missed that. Here's how the sermon begins. We might not be in the garden where God lives, but he will come out of the garden and meet you where I did start like that, right? I did start like that, that, that even though they were thrown out the garden, he still showed up on the day. And he blessed, and he blessed, and he blessed. The principle is this. God first and grow to where he transcends everything on that sheet. But begin. Here's how he said it in the New Testament. And God is audacious. Only he could do this. It was offering time. And it was one of those faith churches, so they locked the doors. <laughs> and they had the $100 line over there. And the $50 line over there. And they had the poor line in the middle. I was folk like me. And so he went and stood over at the $100 line to see who was lying and whose checks was going to bounce. Because <laughs> folk want to look good. He went over to the $50 line, and he looked in the basket. It's a bunch of phonies. And then he went over to the center line where folk had messed up their lives and couldn't get it right. But one lady made a commitment to put him first, and all she had was a mite. And she reversed the budget and put God up top, and she dropped her mite into the budget. <laughs> and so it was his turn to preach. So he got up and says, that woman has done more. Grow to the amount, begin where you are, and be consistent with God. Listen to what I'm going to say, in your worship. Begin where you are, keep him up top, and be consistent with God in your worship such that when God, listen to how I'm going to say this, comes down to meet us where we are, he brings the fire with him. Is this making sense, guys? Amen. Giving is a critical act of worship. Just don't make the mistake of telling him, I can't afford you this week. You don't want him saying that to you. I know I don't. You kind of get what I'm saying? So don't just come with the songs and the tongues and the upraised hands and the mighty prayers. Take a moment to thank him 
for the garden that he planted, for the water that he provides, for the seed that he gives, for the life that he gives us. And let's begin the process of eliminating sin crouching at our door. By when we come to the day day with the Lord, we have something to offer him. Does this make sense, guys? Are you with me? Y'all not mad with me, right? Okay, good. Bow your heads. 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 As the worship team comes, here's the prayer. Here's the prayer. And only you can do this. Then we're going to allow God to have his way. Lord, help me to do what's right. Lord, give me the faith to trust you like that. Give me the strength to believe in you like that. I think I am guilty of being Cain at points in my walk with God. But I want to change that around. And I want to put God where he rightfully belongs in my life. As we talk about breakout worship. As we talk about offering to God. Just get that budget out and reverse it. That's all. Thou shalt have no other God before me. Not in the form of a graven image of things in heaven above or on earth beneath or even in the sea below. Don't bow down to it. Don't worship it. Don't do none of that stuff. And a lot of us in here have messed up our lives. It's all good. It's okay. We can fix it. Because here's what Jesus did. He left his home in glory. And came all the way down, transcending the cosmic realm to the earth realm to redeem us into a relationship with him. Man, that's God. He leaves the garden and comes to where we are to bring us back into a relationship with him. As you're praying this morning, if God's speaking to you, I want to just allow him to touch your heart. Allow him to be God in your life. Allow him to do what he needs to do. But say, Lord, help me put you first and keep you first. That's the true act of worship. The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, true worshipers, true worshipers will worship me in spirit and truth. It's holistic. It's a lifestyle. How we conduct ourselves at home, on a job, in church on Sunday. (sighs) He wants to be God in our lives. So Holy Spirit, as your word has gone forth this morning. I thank you for you, God. Thank you for what you're doing and how you're moving in our midst, Lord. It's good that we can sing songs to you. Now you're challenging us at the next level. To put you first. Don't come to worship without saying thank you for how you blessed. Thank you for how you moved. Thank you for how you graced us, God. Every person under the sound of my voice, inclusive of myself, forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us. We're going to move to break out worship, authentic worship. But we're not going to fool ourselves at home into thinking you are where you are not. Let's be honest with ourselves. And it begin by us saying, forgive us. So thank you, God. Move in our midst. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen. Amen.